Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to uh, uh, welcome back uh, Sam uh, Tyra to Caltech and uh, to the uh, Gelsit seminar. So uh, Sam um, got his um, undergraduate degree at University of Tennessee um, and um, then uh, came to Caltech. We were just relaying a story about how he how he sort of got to Caltech, but he uh, he arrived in uh, uh, 2002, I guess, and um, completed his PhD in 2008. Uh, he spent uh, some time in Japan after that, working for Honda. Uh, and um, Sam, I'm, I was put on the spot here, uh, so I hope I remember all the things that you did. But uh, after that, I think he went to Florida State, where he was an assistant professor, uh, and uh, then um, uh, associate professor, and then uh, more recently he moved to uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, and um, he has uh, won uh, the early career awards from AFOSR, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sam, also from uh, ONR, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe two or three others. I'll let you say that if, uh, if I've uh, forgotten what the others are, but he's, he's won lots of awards, and uh, he's going to be... Um, talking to us today about uh, the complex dynamics of unsteady flows. Sam? All right. Thank you, Tim. Um, thanks for a nice introduction. And also thank you for uh, training me at Caltech uh, amongst uh, other faculty members. I do see some names that I took class from. So this is super special. Uh, Beverly, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to give a talk today. Um, this is really uh, an honor to come back to Caltech and give this talk. So. I'm excited at the same time. I'm also um, a little bit intimidated uh, because I know to me as a graduate student, these seminar meant something to us. So um, again, uh, thanks. And uh, let me talk uh, about my talk today. I said tackling, uh, or I titled it as tackling the complex dynamics of unsteady flows. And I use the word tackling because we're gonna go full force with all the resources that we have in our group to um, do flow control of some of these unsteady flows. And I'll explain why we're interested in doing this. Okay, and I hope everybody can see my slides. Okay, um, let me start off by the acknowledgement. Um, this is not uh, a single person effort. Of course, it's based on our student and postdocs effort. And I'm gonna highlight a lot of the efforts that uh, um, Chiang Ye, who was a PhD student and now currently a postdoc, they have just joined NC State as a faculty member. Uh, Yang Sun has also been instrumental in developing a lot of the tools. John, Kai have also been great in helping us out. You'll see some of the results. And we have wonderful collaborators uh, that you might already uh, recognize here. Steve, Koji, Romit, uh, Nesar, and Peter. And all of this wouldn't have been possible without the uh, generous support from our sponsors at DOD and NSF. Okay. Um, so let me provide a motivation as to why we're interested um, in flow control and unsteady flows. So I'm showing some pictures. You'll see lots of planes. It's going to be really focused on exterior aerodynamics today. So um, unsteady flows, as everybody knows, are encountered in many engineering problems. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on aerodynamics today. Uh, if you just look at the pictures on the side, you see an aircraft landing on an aircraft carrier and on a quiet day, it might seem quite nice and pleasing, but on a rough sea, or if you're flying directly into the wake of a bridge, you can imagine there's a lot of unsteadiness this aircraft has to fly through and hopefully land safely uh, throughout the, uh, in, during this process. There's also aircraft applications where you are landing into its own wake or trying to take off while you have a lot of unsteadiness generated by its exhaust. This is something that are encountered not just by engineering system, but also in biological systems. So we see uh, birds flying in gusty conditions. They're able to take uh, control of these large scale unsteadiness. Uh, and we're expecting to see more and more of these as we push the boundaries on aircraft operation, that being either for because of um, civilian use, we're hearing more of these, um, let's see, let me get my laser color here, laser pointer. Um, right over here, you're seeing these personalized vehicles uh, flying in urban environment, uh, where we expect a lot of these uh, wakes to be pretty strong relative to the size of the uh, vehicle. And you're also seeing some military application where they're gonna have to fly uh, even if the operational condition is not favorable to the operation of the aircraft due to some unsteadiness. 
So what our group is thinking is that we're gonna to have to address these issues by either modifying the flow or having the ability to modify the flow. And what we're going to be considering here in this talk is what we call uh, flow control. So modifying the behavior of the flow field through some actuated means. Okay, so what are the challenges uh, while we try to do so? Um, so I used to work at a car company and this car company had robots and they, you know, I, we talked with our colleagues over there and they said, yes, you know, the control problem is complex. And I always kind of uh, wish we had similar setups where they have rigid links or maybe even a flexible link. In the case of fluids, we don't have a link. We have fluids, which is flimsy and it's a continuum. So what we're dealing with in terms of control is this high dimensional nonlinear dynamics that we have to first be able to describe and then reduce the dimension get the essential dynamics and hope that we can control it, right? And there's usually some time lag associated with these things. Now, the traditional approach was to depend on a lot of trial and error uh, type uh, approaches to see if we can control really complex physics like the one that I'm showing here. This is a turbulent flow simulation that we've done over a hump. Um, and there's a lot of trial and error types uh, flow control studies that you can do to see if you can make these recirculation zones smaller for certain purposes, but these things are pretty expensive, both from an experimental point of view and also from a CFD point of view. Now, what we're gonna to want to do, and I'm gonna focus on this today, is we wanna see if we can leverage high-performance computing and data science to see if we can um, get some physics-driven flow control activities. And I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to talk a lot about here, but I'm also gonna emphasize that there's gonna to have to be a close collaboration between the computational people and the experimental people to make this really fruitful. Okay, so let me give you my biased point of view in terms of the starting point. And um, this is just a perspective, at least for this talk, right? So we have the following, we have the Navier-Stokes equations that's well established and we have CFD solvers. We also have big data. We have lots and lots of data. In fact, we have so much data right now that sometimes it won't even fit on hard drives or maybe you would just store them in a hard drive but never look at them again. But we have a lot of these. And we also have big operators. So based on these CFD solvers, and if you have a massive grid, you can also generate these operators. What we're gonna do is we're gonna try to take advantage of all of these insights to see if we can use all this knowledge or I guess um, bits and pieces of information to enhance the understanding of fluid flows and use them to model and predict the dominant behavior of flows. Okay, so what do I mean by all this? Um, I've been saying big data, just to give you an idea, here is what well, would, uh, you know, a visualization of the linearized and average Stokes equations. And I'm just writing it as Q dot is equal to LQ. And this is pretty massive. Right, so the size of Q, the state variable is gonna be dependent on the number of grid points you have in the spatial domain times the number of variables, roughly speaking. And this can easily be beyond a million or a billion in, in many cases. And what I'm showing here is some of the cases that we get to study using some of the traditional techniques, which is usually for a much smaller dimension, but this cartoon is actually a lie because when I generated this, this is more on the log scale. So the actual system that we get to deal with in textbooks are much smaller. It will be smaller than a pixel on your screen. So we have to be pretty careful about how we scale up to these massive problems that the fluid mechanics side is gonna require. So this is gonna require things such as modal analysis where you extract the dominant features, which I'll talk about today. We also need to talk about how to compress data and model the behavior in some accurate way. So these are where the challenges are, at least in terms of the data size. Now, um, how does this work? Um, so I'll give you sort of a physical uh, argument from these things. Although we're dealing with large scale flows with massive Reynolds number sometimes, just to give you an idea, here is a picture uh, taken uh, from the space shuttle of flow over an island uh, in, uh, off the coast of Japan. And you can see structures and any of us would immediately identify these uh, in fluid mechanics as the Kármán shedding. And our eyes can be a very, very good tool in identifying this. The hope is that we can extract these dominant structure or low dimensional dynamics from the flow field using mathematics and hopefully related to something that we're much more uh, uh, accustomed to in seeing or handling, for example, flow over cylinder and laminar flow. Okay, so, um, 
the timing of all this effort, I think is perfect in my opinion. And that again, it might be my biased opinion, but it's a really exciting time because now there are a lot of data science driven techniques or machine learning techniques that are being developed. Um, and they also have lots of data driven techniques. These are uh, have um, big data in mind as they're developing these techniques. So the idea is that, well, can you go beyond traditional statistical analysis that we have been doing and I also cherish these traditional techniques too from fluid mechanics, but can we go beyond those? And you know, it's very um, challenging nowadays just because of the sheer amount of data that you have that in, you know, visualization and looking at these flow features over and over as a graduate student or a researcher in front of a computer screen, there's a limitation to how much you can do. So we wanna take advantage of these explosion of new ideas coming from data science. And, I just thought I'll share this next thing. And I saw this email that was from the Department of Energy. I like the fact that they're supporting these activities, but I, I chuckled when I saw this thing called the ultra modern data analysis tool. So uh, I didn't consider what I was using was ultra modern data analysis tool, but it's kind of nice that the government is seeing this as something super exciting. Okay, so let me first start with an example problem and see how we're gonna perform some of these flow control efforts, or at least try to approach these flow control efforts. So we're gonna talk about resolving analysis, which a lot of you may be very familiar with. Okay, so let me set the problem. I'm gonna be focusing on separation control for the next few slides. And let's say uh, I go down to a lab and ask my students, okay, we have a, a unsteady flow, a separated flow over an airfoil, and we want to modify the behavior so that we get certain types of benefits let's say lift enhancement or drag reduction. And I will also supply you with an actuator, let's say DVD plasma actuators, or in this particular case, we're gonna consider what's called a thermoacoustic actuator. If you're interested, I can talk more about that, but let's just say there's some way of modifying the flow. Now, when I was a graduate student at Caltech, I took classes in CDS and it says, okay, you need to look at these things from control theory called transfer function, Bode plots, and you can design controls uh, or controllers, which was great. Now you try to take that idea and try to go to fluid mechanics. It's kind of a mess because the dimension of the state variable is so large and we have strong nonlinearity. So the question is, well, what can we do? So let's take this example. We're gonna talk about what we're gonna do or at least a suggestion from our group as to what could potentially work. And our goal is to develop a physics-based design of active technique for separation control. We're going to consider a case of a flow over an airfoil, method of row 12 airfoil, spanwise periodic, angle attack is nine degrees with a modest Reynolds number 23,000. So this is being solved with LES, Charles from Cascade Technology, uh, and Mach number is 0.3. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to put in some actuators near the leading edge. These are heat flux actuators motivated by what we call the thermoacoustic actuators. But just think of this as putting in some vortical perturbations at the leading edge. And the idea here is that we want to know what kind of frequency we should be actuating at. And also the spanway spacing at which we should be placing for which we should be placing these actuation actuators. I'm going to fix the actuation power for now, but we can change it. But for now, for this discussion, we're just going to have a normalized power of about 9%. And this is fairly, these numbers are fairly similar to what you would be achieving with experimental setups for like a plasma actuator. Okay, so let me just show you what these flows will look like in simulation settings. So at the top, there's this baseline simulation. Let's see if it plays. Hopefully, it'll, okay, now it's playing. So the baseline, this is the Q criteria colored, I believe by the streamwise velocity. You see the leading edge um, vortex sheet is separated. It rolls up into large spanway structures and you have this massive separated region. If you put 2D control, so no spanway variation, but just actuating at a particular frequency, you start to see that you can chop up these vortices and you, you can turn the 3D flow into a 2D flow. And it has some nice effects in terms of drag reduction, right? Now, if you put in three dimensional perturbations, so you have spanway spacing at a particular spacing that is, uh, you can break apart these vortices much quicker. So the question is, okay, well, can we avoid having to do a lot of these simulations? Because although the Reynolds number is still modest, 23,000, it is still pretty expensive. In fact, behind the scene, we ran a lot of these calculations. And so DOD was nice enough to offer us a lot of computation time. And each of the dots are 
corresponding to each of these LES calculations. And for alpha of six degrees and nine degrees, we considered a multitude of cases over frequency on the axis, x axis. And these different symbols are showing the spanwise spacing. So zero is 2D and then 10 pi, 20 pi, 30 pi. These are a particular spanwise wave number that you can consider putting these actuator in. Now, the baseline cases are shown in dashed lines. Uh, potential flow limit is also shown here, but you have drag, lift, and L by D uh, in, in terms of the columns. And what we can see here is if you were to actuate a certain case, you do get a significant amount of drag reduction. Uh, there are some cases where you can achieve lift enhancement over here. You, you see these increases. And of course, L by D ratio could go up if you do it right. Now, this is the trial and error that we want to absolutely avoid, although we've done it, just to prepare some um, references that we can compare to later. Now, the idea here is, well, can we come up with a way to identify these cases which are very attractive in a much cheaper way. Okay. So what we've done is we've taken a lot of inspirations from our colleagues in terms of the global analysis. So these, you, you probably have heard about stability analysis or resolve analysis. This is exactly what we're doing. So here, if you take the uh, Navier-Stokes equation and you linearize it, now here we're gonna linearize it about the mean flow. It's not exactly the equivalent uh, or, the, or the equilibrium point. You're going to uh, 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 take a linearized number of Stokes equation about the mean flow. And this is really based on uh, Beverly's group's pioneering work and trying to analyze turbulent flow about the mean flow, assuming that the perturbations are in statistical stationarity. We're following the same approach here, which actually works quite well for us too. And what we're going to do is instead of looking just at stability analysis, we're going to put the nonlinear terms on the right hand side, in, including the actuation forces, and we're going to develop a relationship between the input forcing and what would happen at the output, okay? So to give you more details of this, you would relate the forcing input to the output, the state variables, okay? And in between, you have the resolvent operator, right? And to look at what this resolvent operator is really doing in terms of the dominant modes or sense, uh, we're gonna be performing a singular value decomposition of this resolvent operator. Right? And here's just a cartoon. You can do as SVD. So you have Q sigma F, or you might have been uh, F star. You might remember these as U sigma V star. But here, what these mean is you have some forcing input around the airfoil. This will be F. Um, these are ordered in the um, increasing order of this, um, the singular values or gain, right? So each frequency omega, you would get a gain, right? So you can even map out the uh, amplification over frequency. And you also see how the system is gonna respond in terms of the response mode. So you can see what the response flow or uh, the unsteadiness is going to be like. I'm gonna come up, come back to this because I do want everybody to remember that for external flow, this operator is pretty large, okay, for 2D. And even for 3D, it could be even larger, okay? All right, so you do this resolvent analysis. You get these modes, what we call the response mode and the forcing modes. And again, these modes really tell you how your forcing input is going to be amplified the most if it's like a dominant mode and the response is going to be over here. It's going to fluctuate uh, in this fashion. So here I'm showing the 2D modes for different strew hole numbers. You can get the gain distribution. Uh, over the Struhol uh, spanwise wave number space and you can get large amplification in this region. That's kind of great. But then that still doesn't really give you the full picture of how I can go from a base flow and get reattached flow for a flow control at first. Because if you remember, right, this is still a linear analysis. So what we proposed to do was to look at the departure from linear analysis. So here's the baseline. Uh, this is a cartoon again, where we have some lift. What we wanna do is we wanna find a way to depart from the linear uh, analysis at least consider a little bit of nonlinear terms, right? Some nonlinear, dominant nonlinear terms, and see how that you would kick you away from the baseline towards some desirable controlled flow. And here you need the nonlinear term so that it would interact with the mean flow, right? So at least uh, uh, the easiest thing that we thought we could do is to look, start looking at the Raynal stress. And that's with the hope that the Raynal stress uh, computed by just using the dominant resolving modes will tell you how much mixing it would likely start to uh, uh, stimulate. So just showing what these profiles will look like. Uh, don't worry too much about these numbers here. 
But what we did was once we got these modal shapes, we now integrated um, those quantities over, this, over the airfoil to see, well, how much mixing can we get due to these Raynal stress over the airfoil? So there, we have a window function here just around the airfoil to see how much mixing we can possibly get just from these dominant terms. You can plot that over Stuhl numbers and you will get these curves. And what we'll do is we'll integrate this and call this a mixing metric M, right? Just as we plotted it here. Now we're gonna use this as our guideline, sort of the Bode plot, right? So here, what we can do is, this is kind of the after the fact, but if we identify where these M is gonna be large, we can expect at least some level of mixing would happen triggering um, a laminar to turbulent transition much earlier near the leading edge. And if in fact, if you plot that M, the mixing metric, we call it M, the mixing metric, uh, the naming may not be completely accurate, but here you can actually see that the red region will be identified as promising region for flow control. So it does have high correlation with these LES results showing low drag, high lift and high L over D, which we wanted to identify. But Remember, instead of running these large LES studies, these resolve analysis can be performed just with a baseline flow with, and also just handling these matrices, which made it a lot nicer for us to get to these results much quicker. Okay, so we think this is a really valuable guiding tool for separation control. We also have been testing these ideas for different types of flows with a different type of matrix suitable for each flow. And we're pretty happy with what we're getting right now. Okay, now, if you actually compare it with the full field, we do identify some of these cases that are indeed um, promising in getting low drag and high lift. Okay. Right, so let's talk a little bit about extending these resolvent analysis. Um, and I'll explain why we do so, but I'm gonna start getting into incorporating some ideas from data science and network science, okay? And a lot of these efforts are gonna to go towards higher Reynolds number flow and more on steady flow. Okay, so we, um, we saw this paper by um, uh, Joel Tropp uh, and, and Per Gunnar Martinson, and we got really inspired. There's this nice 2011 Siam review paper that talked about randomized numerical linear algebra. So the, the idea here is this, let's say you get this massive matrix A, we can think of this as being the resolvent operator, and we want to get only the dominant information or dominant modes from this A. Now, I have always been bothered that we get all this massive matrix and the only thing that we get at the end is one single vector or vector pairs. It seems like we're wasting a lot of energy or information just to get so little from so much, right? So this randomized technique seemed pretty promising and important. So what it does, their paper, and of course, this I'm just gonna give you the flavor of it, is you pass what's called a test vector or test matrix psi which is generated just as a random uh, a variable. And you multiply it to A and you get in response a Y. We call this a sketch, right? The sketch should hold some information about the operation of A onto vectors. And that should be useful. That was the, that's the general idea here. And if you think about it, that's pretty interesting, right? So why hold some information? You can use that to get a low dimensional approximation of A, and I'll skip a lot of steps, but that leads us to, or led a lot of people to get this randomized SVD in place. So instead of having to deal with this A, which is massive, again, remember this is a cartoon drawn as a small thing, but for fluid mechanics, this A is massive. And now you can turn it into a much smaller matrix, a low rank approximation of it and get the dominant modes. And it turns out, uh, actually Beverly's group has already done it in 2013. They, they have it uh, used for uh, internal flow applications. People have used this for POD and um, we use this for resolve analysis. It works really well. And so I just wanted to show you what this is gonna look like, but this really got us inspired to look into these randomized techniques more and more. So here's the full resolve and analysis results. We're showing the resolvent mode and the forcing modes. And instead of using this large million by million type matrix, now we're using a test matrix only with the width of K. So this is a really tall and skinny matrix. And then if you did randomized resolvent analysis, just with K equals 10, the, it, this short or a tall and skinny matrix, you can't tell the difference between the left and right. So this was really fantastic. In fact, we've been pushing the limits on this. If you scale things right, if you put some weighing, you can even make K equals two. In some cases, you can make even k equals one and get it in through a single 
um, single test vector. Okay. Now, what does this allow us to do? It means that we can save up on memory, which has been a big hurdle for us in CFD. We can apply it to much higher Reynolds number cases. So the last example was for Reynolds number 23,000. Now we've been working with the Air Force to get their data, which is at Reynolds number half a million. They also have data at Reynolds number a million. We can see that the structures are much smaller for these base flows. And what we can do is we can now analyze what these modal structures will look like. And we were really inspired by these results. We were really happy by it. Chion actually got these results and these are gonna be very useful for doing flow control. Now, on a, uh, a similar, but a slightly different effort, we're now looking into uh, what we call tri-global flow. So instead of having this spanwise periodic setting, we have fully 3D flows. So now we're able to look at the interactions between the tip vortex unsteadiness and also the unsteadiness uh, around, I would say the uh, mid-span region of the flow as these wings are at high angles of attack and we're able to extract the response modes and forcing modes. So this is something we started. These are still preliminary results where now we're pushing the Reynolds number higher and higher. But now we are able to uh, deal with the really large, uh, uh, I would say grid setups. Okay, all right. Now, a couple other things that we are doing, I'm gonna talk about the sparse resolvent analysis. If you have keen eyes, you probably noticed that the forcing mode actually has a, you know, a non-compact support. It was living over not just a few or a small region, but you know, in this case, you can see this for uh, the forcing mode is right here for this particular example, this here for example. It's not, uh, it's kind of difficult to say, well, where should I force, right? So our idea here is now to apply sparse regression or, or, um, spar or compression in terms of the sparsity. So we're now changing the norm to sparsity promoting norms. And now you can change the forcing modes to be pinpointed to, or they would tell you where it is in a pinpointed manner, right? So now I know that if I wanna actuate the flow, it should be right here where this blue dot is. Excuse me, I'm kind of getting... <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is drying up. Okay, now you could say like, well, Sam, there's this point is actually off the airflow. That's actually not a problem. We can actually um, window uh, or resolve in formulation so that we would um, put the actuation region just on the airflow as well. But the fact that you can go to a small compact uh, location is really helpful in pinpointing where exactly we should be putting these actuators. More importantly, what was interesting is that that's not just compact and uh, sparse in terms of the spatial location. We can also pinpoint exactly where we sh which variables we should be considering. So if it was the usual L2 based optimization, it'll give you some combination of which variables you should be forcing. But because now we're doing the sparsely promoting version of uh, resolvent analysis, we can actually find out which variable we should be actually uh, forcing that. So for this particular example, we're seeing that we're not, we shouldn't be putting in much energy here for energy, but we should be putting in lots of, um, in, uh, uh, or, or actuation effort should be focused towards uh, our momentum, right? So this, is, this was a really nice touch that we got uh, from this effort. Okay, now, about time evolving flow. So I've been talking about unsteadiness, unsteadiness, unsteadiness. And you might've said, well, uh, thus far we've seen only steady base flows. Okay. Now we're gonna try to relax that and go to unsteady base flows. So this is, these are the cases where we wanted to flow control, but now the time scale associated flow control and the time scale associated with base flow are gonna to start to become closer and closer in terms of its magnitude. And these applications appear quite often. For example, if you're trying to land a helicopter in the wake of a ship, you can imagine now the wake dynamics and the helicopter aerodynamics is gonna start to interact. So these are really important situations that we see in uh, you know, the everyday operations of these aircraft. Now, let's take some inspiration for network science. This is an area that our group has gone into quite a bit over the past few years, um, probably more than the past few years, but uh, we've been seeing some really inspiring uh, approaches. So I'm gonna share a little bit of those here and try to resolve, uh, relate it to the resolvent analysis. Let's take an, uh, in, uh, sort of an example for passing messages among say six friends. Okay, so these uh, arrows are telling you what the network is gonna look like at that particular time. 
So if A is here, A in blue is gonna start um, passing the information to F and D, right? And um, later in time, um, this D is gonna pass information to F uh, and later A is gonna pass information to B, okay? So the network structure, let's keep that the same for the next case. Now, what happens if we start passing messages at C? Earlier, we passed messages from A, which had the highest number of connection to connections at the initial time. Now we're gonna give it to C. C initially doesn't have any connections, but later on day two, C has two connections. And later in day three, um, both A and E has the right connection to pass information to everybody. So now you can think of this as having a time varying network. And now we're starting to perhaps be able to see the analogy between, okay, the time varying flow or the base flow and what we have here, right? So we're gonna to try to see, or I'm gonna to try to convince you that this is gonna be a really useful tool, okay? Now, since this is a fluid talk, I'm not gonna go into the details of network science, but let me just give you the gist of this. Um, network science is gonna be uh, uh, founded or not founded, but it's really gonna take a lot of information from what we call the adjacency matrix. The adjacency matrix, is gonna tell you how uh, elements are connected. So we call these nodes vertices and these edges or connections are gonna be represented by A. So if there's a connection between node I and J, this adjacency matrix is gonna have an entry AIJ. So AIJ is J's influence on I, okay? And it could be a directed network or it could be a symmetric network. Um, directed, it would be an asymmetric network, okay? Now you can consider that once you put information as F and A will take information to Q. So you can think of this as walks or you can think of this as you know, passing information or maybe even a dynamo system, but you can actually um, allow how the information will spread and having some time scale associated with it. And so in general, you can say Q, the result is gonna be I plus A alpha times A plus alpha square, a square, and you can keep going and add many high order terms as you wish. And there's a parameter called alpha. Now this actually converges, this series converges if alpha is smaller than one over um, rho of a, uh, the spectral radius of a. And it turns out that Q, you can write it as I minus alpha a inverse of f. And if you notice, this looks awfully similar to the resolvent formulation, the resolvent operator here. Now there's this method or uh, centrality called CATS broadcast centrality. It's this resolvent or like operator times a row vector A, just all ones, right? And that's B. So this is kind of used in the network science community to identify which is kind of the U, uh, sort of the effective broadcasting nodes. Now, we can of course do that for fluid mechanics, right? But we're gonna go a little bit further than that. Instead of that, we're gonna take this what we call the CATS function, which looks like the resolvent uh, operator. And we're gonna perform SVD on it, just like what we have been doing for um, uh, uh, the resolvent analysis, right? Now, furthermore, this is actually can be a time dependent function and you can actually expand this in time so that you can track time evolving networks. Uh, and we're following uh, Gringott and Higgins work from network science. And you can also look at this, and this is called a communicability matrix. And you can uh, perform an SVD of the communicability matrix to see where the forcing mode should come so that you get the biggest response over the network, right? Over time, over time. Now, just to give you an, uh, a flavor of what it can do, we're gonna take a 2D isotropic turbulence example. So here, there's really not a base flow, right? Everything is evolving all over the place. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take what we call the Biot-Savart network and the Navier-Stokes network. Biot-Savart network is taking your adjacency matrix based on the induced velocity between two vortices or each and every vortex in the flow. The Navier-Stokes broadcast analysis is going to be based on putting in some perturbation into the Navier-Stokes equation and see how it interacts with every other thing. So I can give you more details, but just... Uh, I, I'd like to convey the idea that if you know if you can identify the interaction between two points, this is exactly what we're trying to quantify to this network based approach. And you can also um, tune some of the parameters. So I mentioned there was alpha. There's actually two parameters, alpha and gamma, and both of these can be related to the physics or physical quantities in the flow. We're going to relate them to the eddy turnover time. Okay. So if you do so, 
you can actually find out that over time, you can identify certain regions in the flow that are really effective in broadcasting perturbations to the entire flow field. Now, if you don't have any memory or if you don't use this eddy turnover time, everything's gonna be very blurred. It's not gonna know, it's gonna have a lot of uncertainty as to where these broadcasting should take place. Okay, so just to give you an idea, let me show you what these things can be useful for. We're gonna put in some of these perturbation based on what we just identified with the broadcasting mode using the CATS uh, function or the communicability function for this unsteady um, analysis. So here on the left, you're seeing the uh, vorticity field. Uh, here is the Bio Savar based broadcasting, the Navier Stokes based broadcasting. I like you to focus on the Navier Stokes uh, based broadcasting analysis. We're putting in the perturbation and we're keeping adding this perturbation. It's a small amount of perturbation. If I remember, it's order 1% of the entire flow field. And you can see that it's, it was near here, but the actuation effort is focused and spatially compact, but you're starting to quickly see and effectively see these perturbations spread everywhere so that the entire flow field is quite different now. Now, I'll play it again. So you start to see very effectively, we're starting to modify the flow field and broadcast this um, perturbation. And we think this is gonna be very useful because later as we're dealing with unsteady flows, even for like these airfoil example, and let's say there's perturbations hitting the wing, we can use similar approaches now to modify or tame these perturbations. We can actually reduce fluctuations as well using these perturbation or this analysis. All right, now, I think I have a little bit more time. So I'd like to talk a little bit more on the sensing side of our effort. And here I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Now this is gonna be more on the full reconstructions that we can do based on limited information. And here I'm gonna take in a little bit of flavor of machine learning, okay? So this is kind of uh, an image that we like to talk about often in our group. Let's say I'm gonna give a little quiz here. Let's say we take this image on the left. This is a very coarse image. And I can tell you that this was from a two-dimensional turbulence simulation, and we're applying the vorticity field. And to a trained eye, you might be able to identify where vortices are. So if the question is, can you make, can you use your pencil or pen to draw what the flow field should look like? You probably could guess that the flow field might have looked like this. Now, some of the details you might have not been able to capture, but for us, we can probably tell that this is a vortex pair, this is a vortex pair, there's a single vortex here, maybe another single vortex here, right? Maybe there's some stretch structure over here. Now, for us, this is easy. The question is, can we ask the machine to do it? Now, this is not, we're not the first people to be thinking about this. This is in fact called super resolution analysis. Originally, it was sort of a method based on interpolation, but later, a lot of people in the computer science field has started looking into the use of machine learning to, um, develop what's on the low resolution side to get something that's high resolution like, right? Okay, so we're gonna be thinking about the same thing, but we're gonna, uh, what I can tell you is that when we do so, we need to include some insights from fluid mechanics to develop these, I would say, neural nets. Now, the idea here is we train so that we find these weights on this network such that you get a you know, minimal error between what you reconstruct and the sort of the training data, the DNS reference. So here's actual example from a cylinder flow wake, right? So it looks pretty good between what the machine learning model will give you and the references. And in fact, this is what the actual machine learning model we had to come up with or the neural nets that we had to use. And it's not simple. It's not, it's not the usual deep learning uh, networks like the CNNs or uh, multi-layer perceptrons. There has to be a little bit more of a thinking that goes into it to be pretty robust and working, but you can put in some ideas about rotational invariance or scale invariance, how they interact. And if you do so, it works pretty good. So let me just show you what the results are gonna look like. So here we have the original vorticity field. This is 2D turbulence again, 128 by 128. And you can say, well, let's give this coarse image. So maybe originally we started with 16 by 16, eight by eight, and we stopped here until our collaborator Koji at Keio University said, well, it kind of works when we tried the super low. So we went all the way to four by four pixels as our input. Here's what a interpolation scheme would give you. It works okay for 16 by 16, but by the time you get to eight by eight, it really doesn't work well. These numbers in the bottom were the L2 error norms. And by the time you go to super low, you can't get anything 
Now, what was surprising is how well these machine learning model will do to reconstruct the flow field. So this is our result for 16 by 16 and eight by eight works really well. To our surprise for four by four pixels too, which we couldn't think that this will work, actually give you the results back quite well, right? And you can do this with, in our opinion, fairly small number of training snapshots. Okay, now you can actually do this in 3D. Um, so you can provide slice information and reconstruct a flow field. So here's the DNS. Here's what we uh, provided as input is three by eight, really coarse. This is for uh, turbulent channel flow at RE tau 180. Um, and you can also do what we call in between. You can actually do super resolution in time too, as long as the, um, you don't lose complete, uh, I would say correlation between two snapshots, you can reconstruct a flow field. Um, you certain, it certainly won't work with linear interpolation or any of these interpolations that are pretty standard. Okay, now you might uh, say, well, does it look well in 3D? It actually looks pretty well in 3D. So you can reconstruct a whole 3D flow field with very limited number of points. And what we're thinking here is that this is not just limited to super resolution now. So what you're providing is coarse input. So if you think of these as pressure measurements or maybe hot wire measurements, uh, uh, um, you can use those information to reconstruct the flow that we have the ability to do so, provided that you have some high resolution reference data. Okay, now, now we are, uh, uh, we pushed it even more in certain directions, but we're happy to tell you that we can do this really just based on sensor measurements. So here's an example, we have eight sensors behind a circular cylinder and these are at various randomly chosen points. We can in, uh, provide what we call the Voronoi image. So we just replace the sensor data over this chosen uh, unstructured grid, just paint it with that color or that sensor data. And you provide that as an input and you can still reconstruct a full field. Now, I know I'm kind of going fast about this, but what you can do is you can merge sensor data with Voronoi tessellation and just use pure sensor data to get to the overall reconstruction of the flow field. Now, it might still not mean much, but let me also tell you that the sensors can move over space. It can change uh, numbers over time. Uh, you can train it with unseen data and it turns out they, uh, machine learning can reconstruct a flow field. All these models can reconstruct a flow field very well. So here, the bottom is the sea surface temperature from uh, NOAA and it works really well. I don't remember the exact number of points that we use. I think it was somewhere around 30 or 40 points to reconstruct the entire uh, globe's temperature or sea surface temperature field, but it really works really well compared to interpolation. Although this might not be a fair comparison, but it, it, and, you know, there's no comparison here amongst the interpolated results and the machine learning reconstruction. So this can perhaps be used for dynamic applications too. We're now looking into reconstructing the flow based on uh, sensor data, combining some of these efforts with our resolvent-based analysis for flow control. Okay, so I'm going to have just one or one slide on short uh, concluding remarks. Uh, we're really exciting that these refreshing ideas from data science and machine learning is pushing the boundaries on some of the traditional approaches that we have been taking for flow control. Um, they are um, very helpful in tackling larger problems and complex problems. So that's why I chose this title, Tackling. Uh, or the word tackling. Uh, we do understand that machine learning and data science are not magical solutions to solve all hard problems in unsafe fluid mechanics, but they certainly are helping us a lot and we're looking forward to uh, making a lot of headways with this. Uh, now we're trying to understand the limitations of what we can and cannot do. And uh, we're developing techniques to remove such hurdles. And one of the big questions in our group is how do we know when models will fail from machine learning? So there's this question of interpolation versus extrapolation, which may not actually be uh, clear cut as what we have been traditionally trained in terms of um, the definitions of interpolation and extrapolation. I can talk a little bit more about this offline later. So, um, now the ongoing efforts and developments are super exciting. Uh, I will be happy to share these again. Uh, if you're interested, please ping me. I'll be happy to share more uh, information or some of the developments that we have. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge our students, Palm Stocks, colleagues, and sponsors for uh, enabling us to do all this work. Uh, Beverly, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to give this talk. And Tim, thank you very much for training me. Uh, it's been great working with you. And I look forward to working with you more in the future. Uh, with that, I'll be happy to take questions.